All right. So we left off last time talking about sex determination. So we're going to spend some time talking through these two different mechanisms for how sex actually, uh, actually is, uh, I, I guess I should say, initiated. Because um, whether you're becoming male or female has a lot of downstream effects, right? And so we're going to talk about the fundamental like, thing that turns on either male or female development. But there's a bunch of ways that you can actually change male and female development even after sex determination has happened. So we'll talk a little bit about this. But uh, last time we talked about the fact that there's two mechanisms, two main categories of mechanisms. Either you're going to inherit a chromosome that contains genes on it that turn on the pathway to either becoming male or female, or you're going to have some environmental effect, some temperature or chemical or timing, some type of other non-genetic issue or non-genetic mechanism uh, that's going to turn on whether you become male or female. Okay. So in mammals and some other organisms, but mostly this is true for mammals, it is the presence of the Y that determines the, the fact that the, that organism is going to be male. Okay. So things on the Y are the determining factor. Um, you can actually, uh, the default pattern is to develop as a female, and unless you have the presence of a Y, you're just going to develop as a female. So the Y is the determining factor to take you off of default, right? So a female could actually exist who is, um, this would be uh, hemi, well, what is it? hemigamy, <laughs> only having one of the sex chromosomes. So if she had an X chromosome and nothing else, right, only one X, then it would develop as a female, right? So it's not the fact that she has two Xs, it's the fact that she just has an X, the, the pattern is to go on to be a female, right? So traditional, the female is the uh, homo, uh, homogametic, has two copies of the same, but you could be hemigametic, just have one copy of an X and still develop as a female. If there's a Y present, then you're going to develop as a male. And I've got really funky mammals up here. So, yeah. Is it X? <clears throat> Sorry. Is it X so uh, like a disease, like time filter? Yeah, yeah. So we'll talk about diseases of when you don't inherit the right number of chromosomes in a minute. But I just wanted to tell you that it's not two X's that makes you female. It's the, pres it's the lack of having a Y that makes you a female. Right. This, um, this is a star-nosed mole. That's actually the nose of the mole. Its eyes are way back on the further back on its head. And it's got all these tiny little, I don't know, appendages on the end of its uh, nostrils. Yeah, I put up really bizarre animals. I don't know, it's just kind of in a bizarre animal mood when I put this lecture together. <laughs> So here's a bizarre animal. I mean, look at the size of that animal's neck. That's ridiculous. <laughs> and this is the American, North American bison, which is just a ridiculously huge head. This is just a narwhal, you know, a whale with a horn on it. It's like, and, you know, orangutans are just ridiculous animals, too. Um, this actually brings up an interesting point. Uh, this is a really old male orangutan. And male, and even in us, your facial features continue to grow throughout your lifespan, right? So there's a reason why old people have really big ears. It's because their ears continue to grow while the rest of their face doesn't. So ears, nose, forehead uh, continue to grow even late in life. Now, fairly slowly, but the older you get, kind of the bigger your facial features tend to, tend to get. Um, that's true in, the, in other primates as well. So this is a really old orangutan. And so his chin and his cheeks have just continued to grow over time. So this has nothing to do with genetics per se. It's cell growth, right? But yeah. OK, so that's chromosomal determination. In mammals, the chromosome is the Y. So it's the Y that's determining it. And on the Y, so here's actually two uh, electron. Uh, these are artificially colored, but these are actually electron scanning uh, micrographs. So this is actually looking at the condensed X. There's two copies of it, so this was undergoing cell division. 
So two copies of the x here. Here's two copies of the y. The y is really tiny compared to the x. It doesn't contain very many genes on it. But the really important ones for determining sex are in this region called the sex determining region of y. It's like a cluster of several genes that are all next to each other. So this is the region of the y. Uh, one of those genes is called the testes determining factor, TDF. This is a secreted protein. And basically, it, it helps the male gonadal tissue develop in a male. So the male gonads start making testosterone. And so it's mostly the, the presence of testosterone that gets turned on in the male gametes. So the gametes know, to, or I'm sorry, the, the gonadal tissue knows to become male. The male gametes make testosterone instead of estrogens. And it's the presence of the, es or the testosterone and the lack of estrogen that's what actually makes the embryo develop phenotypically like a male. So like I said, the, the presence of the X is the, the critical factor. Having the sex determining region on that X, the expression of the testes determining factor, and then the hormones. Now we're actually talking about when you actually start showing the features of a male or female. So you can change male and female anywhere along the line, right? If you can artificially suppress testosterone and artificially increase estrogen, you can get a, ma a mammal embryo to develop like a female. But at the fundamental thing, the inheritance way, it's because it was inherited on the, on the Y. Will, do you have a question? Uh, you were saying in the previous slide that it's not um, uh, the, the presence of the X that makes a female. But it's that the, but it's more correctly the lack of Y. The lack of Y. So yeah. um, it, it's going to sound like a funny question because I feel like I know the answer. But why do we need the the male then if if to have a, a girl? Like why would we need the male to have a girl? I'm assuming it's to have the other set of chromosomes generally. But but is like you're yeah. saying, it doesn't necessarily you would get a girl anyway. So you're saying. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I mean. You don't have to have a Y to have a female. <laughs> right. So you can think of, and I don't know if this is where you're going, but you can think of wacky alternative reproductive methods that don't require having a male around at all. Right. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's, that's suggest, absolutely yeah. true. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So. So we're not needed. No. <laughs> well, you're needed to make other males. <laughs> so, but to, I guess, in theory, to perpetuate the species, if, you know, if, if we could use, uh, uh, non-sexual reproductive techniques, you could just reproduce all females, right? Yeah. That's, that's not how most organisms <laughs> do it. You have male and female sexes, but there are some organisms that don't have male and female sexes, right? Yeast or bacteria or, I mean, there's lots of other ones that don't have male or female. So if that organism is rep reproducing without, without uh, sexual dimorphism, right? There's just one kind then we don't usually call it male or female anymore. We just say it's that organism, right? So if we say that a group of organisms has a male and female, it means there's a difference, right? So I don't know. It's like a tautology, right? <laughs> yeah. I have a question. You mentioned about that, that you can suppress the Y condition mm -hmm. and increase estrogen. Yeah. No, that, so they actually, you can actually do that. I don't, people haven't done that in humans, but you can actually do that in, um, I don't know where these experiments actually have done, but you can, you can think about them being done. If you saturate you know, uh, uh, a mouse embryo that you've got growing outside of the female's body and just saturating it with a certain hormones, then you can get the, pattern, the pathway to go. So I don't actually know what organisms this has been done, but the experiments have been done. So You can also think about the fact that if you have a mutation in the sex determining region of Y or in the testes determining factor, you can inherit a, a Y, but if you have a mutation for this and you don't express the testes determining factor, then even though there's a Y present, that individual st will still develop on the female pathway because female is default, right? So you can have an XY individual mutated on the, one of these genes in the sex determining region, that's going to develop as a female. You could also, well, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Actually, I'll answer your question first. So if you were an XY and you're being mutated, like if you got genetically tested, then you genetically test with a male or a female? Well, it depends on what you mean. <laughs> um, 
it's probably more accurate to say, do you have a Y chromosome? Because an individual who is XY but has a mutation in one of these genes is going to develop like a female and is going to have externally female characteristics. And oftentimes, there are people who don't know that they have a Y chromosome. Females who are walking around don't know that they have a Y chromosome. When they get married, try to have children, they probably have defects in separating their chromosomes and making gametes. And so they actually go in for testing and then recognize, oh, I'm actually, I actually have a Y chromosome. But, but that doesn't mean you're a guy, right? I mean, it just means you have a Y chromosome. You've developed and lived like a female, right? So this kind of pushes the idea of like, what do we mean by male and female, right? It's not strictly chromosomes, right? So it's something, I don't know, more fundamental, less fundamental than that? I don't know. Yeah? If, if that happens, is it possible for the cosmic to inherit two Y chromosomes? Two Y chromosomes. I guess it's theoretically possible. I don't know of a lot of these cases, um, but I guess it's theoretically possible. Um, it's usually. You usually, you usually have difficulties becoming a fully mature female <laughs> if you are XY. There's other developmental things that go on that you don't quite make it like through puberty and get to the reproductive stage. So it's, there's other underlying problems there. But I guess in theory, you could have a female who actually was XY, and so she could make an egg that has a Y chromosome, fertilized by a sperm from a male that has a Y chromosome, and you could get a YY individual now, that YY individual is not going to make it because there's essential chromosomes on the X that are just necessary for everybody to have. So if you don't have an X chromosome, you don't develop and you die. But I guess, in theory, those two gametes could be made and could fuse. It wouldn't result in a viable offspring, though. So. Now, you could also have rare occasions where you're an XX individual, but recombination happened between the X and the Y chromosomes during pro-metaphase pro of meiosis. So in pro-metaphase of meiosis and in, in the first meiosis one, when the homologous chromosomes are aligning, so two copies of chromosome one are hooking up with the two copies of chromosome two and you're doing recombination, the two copies of X and the two copies of Y get moved to the center of the of the chromosome or the center of the cell on the spindle. And they're moved apart from each other in meiosis one. And there are some very rare occasions where the X and the Y actually recombined. It was very, very rare. But you could actually then get the sex determining region of Y recombined and put on one of those X chromosomes. That individual is going to develop like a male because it's got the sex determining region. It's going to be expressing testes determining factor high levels of testosterone, and so you could have a male walking around when genotypically he actually has two, chro two X chromosomes. Again, that'd be very rare and probably would have developmental problems, but it's, it's at least possible. Right. Yeah? Um, is, is this people that um, are hermaphrodites? Having both, is that, is that mm -hmm. having to do with the expression of the genotype? No, it's usually, it's usually a hormonal problem. Oh, okay. Where they're making lots of testosterone and lots of estrogen, and so the the uh, the reproductive organs kind of get confused, and so they're kind of a mix of both. Uh, there's there's no instances where you actually have fully formed male and fully formed female reproductive organs in the same individual. It's a confusion, um, unless it's an actual hermaphroditic organism, and that's completely different. So I'm thinking of humans, right? There's no true hermaphroditic humans, right? It's just a, a basically confused. So they, now, there's some them. organisms that do make them, like the sea squirt makes, you know, makes uh, testes and ovaries in the same organism. But they, they aren't doing this kind of sex determination, right? Uh, they're just sea squirts. There's really no male and female. <laughs> they're just sea squirts, right? There's no sexual dimorphism, so, yeah. Isn't there like a syndrome where you have like X, Y, Y? Yeah, we'll talk about that in just a minute, yeah. Yeah, Rachel. If, if that sex determining region of Y accidentally got put on the X chromosome, then it would act like a Y chromosome and would make a male. 
Okay. So since we're talking about chromosomes separating, I want to talk about when chromosomes fail to segregate properly. So in a normal X chromosome individual, we're just looking at just the X chromosome, and we're looking at meiosis, metaphase of meiosis 1, okay? So here we've duplicated the genome, so we've got two copies of X. You know, one of these, uh, this pair of sister chromatids, this is an X that, let's say, came from the mom. This is a female individual, so she got an X chromosome from dad. He went through S phase, and you duplicated both of those, right? So I've got identical sister chromatids. I've got homologous chromosomes between the maternal and paternal contributions. In the first phase of meiosis, you recombine, and then you separate the homologous chromosomes, right? So each of those cells gets, um, gets identical Xs. And then in the second meiotic, you separate the now reshuffled sister chromatids, and you get the three, or I'm sorry, the four different gametes, right? That's normal uh, disjunction is what we call it, normal segregation. Um, in non-disjunction, this is when you actually move the chromosomes uh, to the wrong sides of the cell, okay? So here, this would be non-disjunction in meiosis one. So instead of the spindle separating the two homologous chromosomes, accidentally, both of them went to this side. So one cell got both, or all four of the chromosomes. This cell got none. When this divides, it can't separate those chromosomes because there are no chromosomes to even align. So these gametes, whether they're eggs or whether they're sperm, are missing one of the chromosomes. So that's what I'm calling zero, right? That's lacking the chromosome. These gametes actually have two copies of X. Now they're reshuffled versions, but they actually have two X's in them. So you can think this is gonna be weird genotype now if that individual gets fertilized by a sperm, because now that sperm's gonna bring in a third sex chromosome. So you have the potential to be XXX or XXY, depending on what sperm fertilizes that egg, if we're thinking about females here. You can also have non-disjunction in the second round. So maybe first round happens normally, but it's in second round that you move the chromosomes to the wrong side. So here I could have just one individual's XX, the other is lacking the X chromosome. So this brings up a couple of interesting syndromes where you have gametes that actually get made like this and actually get fertilized and carried to term. The first one is called Turner syndrome. Turner syndrome is where, well, we'll just talk about the genotypic description. So the genotype we would say is 45X. A normal individual is 46 and either XX or XY, right? So 46 normal chromosomes, and then you'd indicate what sex chromosomes they got. So a normal female would be 46XX and a normal male would be 46XY. This individual is 45, that means it's missing one chromosome. The chromosome it's missing is one of the X's because this is a 45X, right? It's missing the second X. So if you actually look at the karyotype, it's got you know, normal pairs of all of the chromosomes, all of the autosomes, but when you get to the sex chromosomes, only one X, and no second X. So this is the XO that I was talking about before. So this individual is going to reproduce, or is going to develop like a female, but when they reach puberty, they typically do not have uh, normal secondary sex characteristics that show up. So these individuals kind of perpetually look like they're in adolescence. I forget what the age of this individual is. Yeah, my, my text or where, where I took this from didn't tell me the age of this individual. But this is an individual who has already expected to have gone through puberty, probably is like 18 or 19 years old, but is still looking like you know, a 12-year-old girl. It's because the presence, the, the lacking of one of those X chromosomes has just uh, upset the balance of hormones in her body, and so she's not developing secondary sex characteristics. Now, you can go on hormone therapies, and that's usually what they do with these individuals. They're like very low in estrogen, uh, in, the, in the whole suite of estrogens, there's actually several of them, and they'll go on estrogen um, supplements, pituitary supplements a little bit to get their height up and things like that. And so that they look more like a normal 
uh, individual. They're going to be having a really hard time making eggs and sperm, though, because every time this individual's um, germ cells try and go through meiosis, they're not going to have another set of X chromosomes to pair up. So they're going to get to the first, they're going to get to the first um, meiotic division, and they're going to try and align the chromosomes in metaphase. And she's going to have two copies of one X, but nothing to line it up with. That usually just means that the, the cell stops undergoing meiosis, and she won't ever uh, make uh, uh, mature eggs. Won't be able to go through the two rounds of meiosis to make eggs to be fertilized. So these are almost always, individuals like this are almost always sterile. Even though we can supplement with hormones and make them look more like an adult female, she's probably not going to be able to make eggs, viable eggs. Now, maybe there's, there's ways to go in and actually get those germ cells and mature them in a petri dish and, and get them to undergo in, in vitro fertilization. There's lots of people pushing the, uh, 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 pushing the limits of, of gamete uh, development here. I don't know about those experiments, but in theory, they're possible, I guess. If you could take out, because she still has viable germ cells. And if we, if we could trick the cells into just going through meiosis anyway, selecting for ones that actually have chromosomes, just fertilizing those, there's kind of technical ways that we're trying to develop to get around this. But normally, this would be a sterile individual. So. What's my opinion on in vitro? I have a whole lecture dedicated to stem cells and in vitro fertilization. <laughs> so I'm going to punt that question until we actually get to it. So, yeah. Right now, I'm just telling you what's possible, not, not what I agree with. OK. So that's Turner syndrome, missing one of the x's, or missing one of the y's, for that matter. This is Kleinfelter's. Kleinfelter syndrome is an individual, so had non-disjunction, and, and in one of the gametes, either in the eggs or in the sperm, had two copies of the x. And then the other gamete had a copy of the Y. So I guess this has to be two copies of the X must have come from the mother, right? Because where else are you going to get a Y? Okay. So non-disjunction in the mother gave you two X's in the egg. Sperm brought in a Y. And so this individual is 47, indicating it's got one extra chromosome. And then we tell you what the X's are, X, X, Y. So the extra chromosome is actually one of the extra X's. Uh, this individual is going to be look male. But since there's two X's, they tend to kind of have female characteristics. Again, this is hormone levels, but these are males who have really high levels of estrogen. And so they tend to have kind of more female characteristics. So you can see there's kind of some, uh, some excess uh, fat tissue around the breast region. Uh, they kind of have low muscle mass, higher fat content, uh, underdeveloped genitalia. So they often um, will have low sperm counts and low fertility. Again, this is because when they go to make gametes and they try to align three chromosomes together, most of the time the cell, the, the spermatogonia that's trying to go, undergo meiosis, doesn't know how to segregate those chromosomes. And so sperm production just stops. Now, there are some individuals, and in fact, I know, I know someone whose brother actually has Kleinfelters. Um, and this can range, because it's a hormone level, you can have kind of a spread of what the actual characteristics look like, right? Um, they may be, you know, only have slightly female characteristics or may, this is a very severe case in terms of like very small genitalia. So you can have a range. And there will be, in some cases, some sperm that actually get made that, that find their way to se segregate these chromosomes. Now there's a higher instance of having the offspring have Kleinfelters because when this male makes his sperm, he might be giving extra chromosomes. Um, but this friend that I know, his brother actually does have one son. So low sperm count, they only had one child, but it, it's usually these individuals are sterile or, actually, or have a lot of trouble conceiving. So was there another question? I yeah. had a question. I wondered, um, and this, anyways, uh, how, does the, how do they develop, how do they develop um, uh, psychologically? Again, it's a huge range depending on what the levels of estrogen are. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean that's that's one of the factors. So, um, I mean there there's some perfectly normal males too that just 
that don't have any chromosomal problems that just have, for whatever reason, higher levels of estrogen. So they'll have higher levels of, of fat tissue, you know, less, less secondary male sex characteristics, you know, won't have a really thick beard, you know, will kind of have a baby face, boyish look to them. Um, and there's, there's actually individuals who have high enough estrogen levels that their, um, that their actual breast tissue will actually make milk. <laughs> so, um, so when you're talking about hormone level, there's a huge spectrum. And then how those individuals you know, develop psychologically is a huge spectrum as well. So, yeah. I mean, obviously, if you, have, if you look male except, you know, except you're not developing the secondary sex characteristics, I mean, that's usually fairly traumatic for an individual. So. And again, you could treat these individuals with high levels of testosterone and try and kind of compensate and, and get them to show more secondary male sex characteristics. But it's not going to solve the underlying genetic problem. Other aneuploidies in terms of the sex chromosomes. So aneuploidy is just a, a, a wrong number of chromosomes. So there's a whole region of aneuploidies. Um, you can actually have XXX females. Uh, when you, whenever you have extra chromosomes, you tend to just, the organism grows larger for whatever reason. So XXX individuals are usually large females. There's also uh, XYYs. So these will have no problem looking like male. They'll actually kind of be larger males, but will probably be sterile again, right? What's the, what's the spermatogonia going to do when it's trying to align three chromosomes? It doesn't know what to do. And then there's also uh, variations on Klinefelters, right? The Klinefelters I showed you before were XXYs, but you could have XXXY or XXYY. Again, that's just going to confuse the hormone levels, and so you're going to have what we term Klinefelter syndrome. These are obviously very, very rare, you know. An individual like this is probably going to be one of those rare individuals who had Klinefelters, who was able to reproduce, and then passed on an extra set. Um, but it gets, you know, when a rare individual has an even rarer disease as an offspring, uh, this is theoretically possible, but I don't know how common it is. OK. One last question, and we'll talk about other sex character, sex determining mechanisms. Yeah? Uh, no, it's not usually due to mutations. It's due to just cell defects in terms of how the cell sets up its spindle and how it moves the chromosomes. And so, I mean, maybe there's some more underlying genetic level of like, you know, a mutation that's meaning you're not, fail you know, mutant protein that means you fail to set up your spindle properly. Maybe there are underlying, you know, proclivities or, uh, to this, but really it's just a cell biology problem. Yeah. Okay. So mammals are X and Y chromosome is how you determine the sex, okay? In birds, in most birds, um, it's the inheritance of a chromosome, but we don't call the chromosomes X and Y. Because in, in birds, the homogametic is what becomes the male. So in, in mammals, the homogametic is a female with XX. In birds, the homogametic is ZZ male, so we call the male chromosome Z, and the male is the homogametic. The female is ZW. So just think of those as placeholders instead of X and Y. Um, but here, the Z is typically the bigger chromosome, and the W, I think, is, is smaller. So most birds are this way. It's just flipped. So. Do they also have the default developmental? They could have all the same defaults that the XY does, mm -hmm. just the proportions would change to skew in terms of male or female the opposite direction. Right? Yeah. So that's most birds. Flies and insects. Flies, you've been breeding flies and we've been talking about flies. They have X and Y chromosomes, but it's not really the presence of the X that is making them male, OK? So in flies, it's the number of X chromosomes that you inherit, OK? So you could have, normally, 
uh, you have an XY that is a male, and an XX is a female. And so it seems similar to, uh, to mammals, right? But in this case, an XO, that becomes a male. Because what is making you a male is not the presence of a Y, it's the lack of two X's. Okay. So an XO individual is going to be male. XX would be female. What's on that Y chromosome? I don't really know. I think these are drone males. You have a sterile male. This would actually be a fertile male. But this is flies, bees, praying mantises. Oh, I'm sorry, not, not, not bees. <laughs> flies, praying mantises, other insects. Bees actually are different. Bees, sex is determined um, not by X or Y, they don't have X or Y chromosomes. It's how many total chromosomes you have. Okay, so I should go back. These individuals are diploid. So this individual male would be diploid. Two copies of every chromosome. When we get to the sex chromosomes, what makes it a male is the fact that it only has one X, okay? So for the whole rest of the organism, they're diploid. They've got two copies of every chromosome. In bees and ants, we're talking about all the chromosomes now. There's no sex chromosomes. There's no XY, there's no ZW. It's just talking about all of the chromosomes that they do have. If you've got two copies of every chromosome, if you're a diploid individual, that is a female individual. If you only have one copy of every chromosome, that means you're a male. Okay, so this is still chromosomal determinants, but it's not individual unique sex chromosomal determinant. This is just how many chromosomes do you have? So this is bizarre, right? Every male actually is a haploid individual, only has one copy. This is why when Mendel tried to reproduce his results in bees, everything went haywire. Because his theory, particulate theory says every, for every trait there's two gametes or two particles inherited, right? But here, males only have one particle, right? So it throws all the numbers off. Now, the fact that these females can mate with more than one male and selectively choose the sperm that they use to fertilize also throws it way off. But like all of your ratios are going to go crazy if you have haploid individuals in your population. Right? Mendel couldn't predict that. So, yeah, Rachel. Is that why you have bees and ants like bigger because they've got that extra? Uh, no, queen bees and queen ants are bigger because they've been given more nutrition and different sugars when they were developing. So they phenotypically look different because they were given different food, actually. But in, in bees and ants, all of the females are diploid. All the males are haploid. OK. So all right. Is like an ability to like make a queen bee or make a... You have to make the queen when she's developing as a, uh, as a larva. Okay. So as she's growing as a larva, when you feed her the extra food and the, the different hormones or the different chemicals in the food, that's what tells it to develop into the queen phenotype. So you can't take an adult female that's not a queen and get it to become a queen. You have to do that through a developing larva. Yeah. OK, so those are the chromosomals. It's either sex chromosomes, uh, the presence of one of the chromosome, the lack of the other chromosome, or total number of chromosomes that you have. Environmental. So now we're switching entirely. We're not talking about chromosomes at all. We're just talking about the environment. Um, temperature is, is the big one that's in uh, a lot of reptiles. So the temperature in which the embryo is kept is what determines what the sex is. So in most reptiles, they don't have X and Y chromosomes. They don't have separate uh, sex chromosomes. It's just the temperature that the embry embryo is at. So every individual has the capability of becoming male or female. It's just what temperature was the embryo at. So if you keep eggs at low temperatures, that usually means male. If you keep them at higher temperatures, that usually means female. If you keep them right in that middle region, you'll kind of have a mix of both. 
Now, once a female pattern gets initiated, it will go completely to female. And if the male gets, pattern gets uh, induced, it'll go completely to male. But at that varying temperature, you'll have broods with mixed male and females. Okay. This is interesting because you can get kind of seasonal effects. If, if eggs were laid in the summer, then they'll generally be female. If eggs are laid in the early spring or the late fall, uh, they will develop as males. And so you kind of have like a you know, little bit of timing differences. Um, so I've thrown up ridiculous reptiles up here, like this giant crocodiles from Indonesia and the Galapagos turtles. But a lot of reptiles do this. And then we come to fish. And everything gets confused. <laughs> because depending on what fish you're talking about, it could be a completely separate mechanism. So some fish, like salmon, this guy's got a giant salmon up in Alaska or something. These are huge fish. Salmon are XX or XY, like, um, like mammals, right? the presence of the Y. Guppies are like birds. So here it's uh, separate sex chromosomes, but it's, you know, the male is the uh, homogametic and the female is the heterogametic. Some, like the sea bass, are like reptiles. It depends on the temperature. There are no sex chromosomes. But then there's some like the zebrafish. And the zebrafish is arguably one of the most studied fish on the planet. We've been doing genetics and developmental biology and, and behavior stuff with the zebrafish forever. We still don't actually know what triggers the pattern to go male or female. So there's no sex chromosomes. And every individual is uh, diploid, right? So it's not, it's not an X or Y method, it's not a Z or W method, it's not a temperature method, it's not a number of chromosomes, haploid, diploid mechanism. There's something that triggers the pattern to, you know, the genes uh, in that embryo to start expressing the male genes and develop the male hormones to develop the male pathway. But there's some other trigger, and we don't even know what it is, that triggers the female genes to get turned on. So there's still a lot of study on this, like we're trying to go further and further back. When do these genes get turned on? What's the most fundamental gene to turn on the male pathway? And we like know which ones they are, but we don't know what is the actual trigger in the embryo to get the expression level of the male gene up and the female gene down. So we still don't even know. Uh, how does it do it? We don't know. There's interesting fish, too, that can actually switch sex late in life. And there's some amphibians that do this, there's some reptiles that do this as well, where they will be actually, could be genetically or, or environmentally, have been developed to adulthood as a male or female. But when there's a disparity between the sexes, when you don't have equal amounts of sexes, if you get a population of these Garibaldi fish and they're all males, they will recognize everyone's a male and some of them will actually re recognize that and will turn on female hormones and will switch their sex to a female sex so that there's a female around and then the males will mate and it can actually perpetuate that. Uh, so this is called sexual transformation. Uh, what I just said was protandry, that is males having the ability to turn into females. Uh, there's uh, protogyny, which is females being able to turn into males. And that's just because the adult fish can change the levels of hormones and will actually change the kind of gamete that it makes. Now, fish don't have you know, elaborate um, external genitalia. Right? A female fish is basically just a fish that makes eggs and lays eggs. And a male fish is a fish that makes sperm and lays sperm. Right? And they just do all the fertilization outside the body, and they're just laying eggs and laying sperm. So basically, they're just telling their germ cells to develop more like an egg or develop more like a sperm. So even though we say it's sexual transformation, it's not like there's huge effects. Now, there will be some pigmentation effects and size effects, um, because often these guys, the, males, the male knows who the female is because of the different coloration on her body. And so that will happen. You can change the coloration in a male will cease to be male-colored and will look female-covered. They can actually go back and forth. So 
one male could change into a female if need be, and then if put in another environment when it needs to change back into a male, it could change back into the male, and the pigmentation will just follow. So. So could theoretically, could it fertilize its own eggs? Could theoretically fertilize its own eggs, yeah. The timing is the issue, right? Can't, can't switch to male quick enough to fertilize its own <laughs> eggs that it laid, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, I mean, True hermaphroditic organisms, though, can sometimes fertilize their own eggs. So the sea squirt and some other marine organisms will actually make eggs and sperm at the same time in their adult life and release both eggs and sperm at the same time, and you could actually have a self-fertilization. Yeah. Which makes doing sea squirt genetics really nice, because you could just fertilize that individual to itself, and it'd be really easy to see the phenotypic ratios in the offspring if you just know that was a self-fertilization. So. Usually, organisms try and protect against self-fertilization. I mean, that's like the worst kind of inbreeding, right? <laughs> Breeding with yourself, right? Not a lot of genetic variation and a variety going on. Um, so most of the time, eggs will resist being fertilized by self-sperm. So there's kind of like a self-autoimmune response. And like, that's my own sperm, and it tries not to get fertilized by it. Um, but in desperate cases, if that's the only way to produce, that's, that's a mechanism to keep going for a while, right? So. Makes for interesting population genetics. Yeah. All right, that's sex determination. We're already starting to allude to this because some of these sex determining factors don't fit the model of Mendelian inheritance, right? Mendelian inheritance says you, you receive, you know, his laws were the gametes, you inherit one of two alleles, right? One or two particles. This is true with with mammal sex determination, right? You're either getting an X chromosome or you're getting a Y chromosome, and, and so you have Mendelian ratios will work for you here, right? Because you can just think of the X and the Y as being different alleles of a gene, right? Um, but if you're, if you're doing some of these other bizarre mechanisms, uh, that's not gonna conform to Mendelian ratios. So what I wanna do now is start talking about, okay, what are Mendel's laws? What can Mendelian genetics predict for you? And then what are the exceptions? What are the things that don't fit Mendelian? So Mendelian is true, but it's only true in certain circumstances. So first law, Mendel's law, is gametes inherit one of the two alleles, and the traits do not blend. So he said there's two particles, one of them's dominant and one of them's recessive and they do not blend, right? You're either gonna be dominant or you're gonna show the recessive phenotype and there's no intermediates. The second law is the law of independent assortment. That says alleles of one gene, and he was working in pea plants, so the alleles that are determining flower color don't, don't affect at all what shape your pea is, whether it's smooth or whether it's wrinkled, right? Those two traits are completely separate. They don't affect each other. Now that's only true if these genes are on separate chromosomes, right? So Mendel's laws are there's two, two alleles and the alleles are truly dominant and truly recessive, and that all genes are on separate chromosomes and don't, don't get inherited in any uh, biased way with each other, right? They're completely separable, uh, independent events, right? So I wanna talk about cases where this isn't true. First case, is when two, tr two genes code for the same trait. Okay, Mendel's laws only hold true if there's only one gene for every trait, right? But what if there's two genes that code for the same thing? So here is, a, uh, is an example in fruit flies. Here is a fly with a black body. So here's the wild type version Wild-type flies, if you've been looking under the scope, they kind of have a tannish um, back of their abdomen. The belly of their abdomen is a little bit lighter, but generally it's tan. This is a, a mutant, uh, you know, a spontaneous mutant, a variety that exists in the population that has black on its body, right? Instead of just making those black pigmented stripes on the, the end of each of the abdominal segments, the whole thing is black. So they're just making lots and lots of extra pigment. There's two genes that could do this, right? So one of the genes is this one we call E. 
if a, if a fly is homozygous recessive for this E gene, they will have a black body. You could also be homozygous recessive for the B gene. That is also going to give you black body. Two separate genes on two different locations in the genome, coding for two different proteins. But either one of them is going to give you the same phenotype, a black body. This is going to throw Mendelian ratios. It's going to, it's going to throw them off, right? Because when you take this black-bodied individual and cross it with this black-bodied individual, those are both recessive genes that are causing it. And traditional Mendelian says, you take two recessives and put them together, everybody is going to get a recessive allele, and all of the offspring are going to be black. Right? But if it's in two different genes, we can get this phenomenon called complementation. So if I cross this pure breeding strain of black bodied flies with an individual from this pure breeding strain of black flies, the offspring that they're going to get is going to be heterozygous at both genes. I'm going to have a good copy of B and a bad copy of B here. So I'm heterozygous for the B, allele, or for the B gene. I'm also going to be heterozygous for the E gene. That's going to mean I'm going to have a good copy of each of them, and I'm going to make a wild type normal looking fly. This is called complementation, okay? Because the good copies of E over here are complementing for the bad copies over here. Good copies of B are complementing for the bad copies here. And so the resulting individual that you get is wild type. And now it's going to act like a dihybrid cross. If you take offspring from this generation, you're going to have, um, you know, predictable, you can do the Punnett square, you can do predictable ratios of what their offspring are going to look like, either wild type or black. But that first generation is going to break the rules of Mendelian, right? Two genes. Um, if two organisms, if you're, if you're curious about what the gene is, so say you're just, you know, sampling flies in the population, and you grab a black-bodied individual and you don't know what its genotype is, and you find another population, and there's a black-bodied individual, and you don't know what it is, um, you can do what's called a complementation test. That would just take, OK, I've got two of these black-bodied individuals. I don't know what the underlying genotype is. Well, if you cross those together, if what comes out is a black-bodied individual, you conclude that the mutation is in the same gene. The same gene is coding for this black-bodied individual and for that one. So if you cross two blacks together and you get a wild type, you would say that they complement each other. If you cross two blacks and you get blacks out of it, you would say they fail to complement. So the defect must be in the same gene if they're failing to complement. Does that make sense? Failing to complement because you've got a, here's the mutant gene. Here's a mutant gene. The, that red is indicating a non-functional mutation the same gene that's coming up here, right? Mutant gene here, and it might be a different mutation, right? It might be at a slightly different place in the gene, but it's the same gene that's mutated, okay? So they've got two alleles, both of them are mutant alleles, you get a black-bodied mutant individual, okay? So you should know what a complementation test is, and you should be able to know when you would do a complementation test. All right, so that's our first exception to Mendel, two genes coding for the same trait. We'll talk about more exceptions to Mendelian genetics next time. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.